Welcome to The View from Israel. I'm Barry Shaw. And today we're going to give you a comprehensive view of the peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, this is the first peace agreement between Israel and the Jewish state and an Arab state for 26 years. How did it come about? What, why did the UAE break the mold? Is it good for the Jews? Uh, and uh, will peace break out with other Arab and Muslim states? Lots of questions, and I'm pleased to have three very special guests today to share their thoughts and knowledge. And I'd like to introduce my first guest, Dr. Mordechai Kedar. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kedar. Pleasure to be here, Barry. Okay, Dr. Kedar is an expert on the Middle East, Islam, and the Arab world. So, Dr. Kedar, tell us about the United Arab Emirates. You know, at Passover, Pesach, at Seder night, we have a song which says, uh, Manish Dana Laila Zah. Why is this night different from all other nights? So, putting it in the Middle East context, why is the UAU different from all Arab states? <laughs> well, uh, th there are significant and very profound differences between the United Arab Emirates and many of the Arab countries, which, by the way, made already peace with Israel, like Egypt and Jordan. First of all, the United Arab Emirates doesn't share borders with Israel. And uh, we don't have any... Uh, we have a problem here. Um, we don't have any territorial issues with the uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, we never had wars with them. Uh, they never sent any troops in order to fight against us, unlike other countries, like Libya or Iraq. And uh, nobody in, in, in the Emirates was personally hurt because of the wars with Israel. Nobody there lost a brother or a, or a father in the wars against Israel, unlike Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. So to begin with, the sediments of hatred uh, which other Arab countries might have uh, 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 do not occur in the United Arab Emirates, and this already is a good beginning. However, uh, uh, we should always also remember the, the historical background of this uh, country, of the United Arab Emirates, uh, just to put things in order. The United Arab Emirates are uh, seven emirates, like Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Ras al-Khaimah, Fujairah, Um Ajman, uh, Ajman uh, Um Kaiwin, and uh, Sharka. Uh, they are united, not like the United States of America, like uh, New York, New Jersey, Florida, and Oklahoma. They are united more like the European Union, like uh, Germany, France, uh, Belgium, and uh, Holland. Uh, they are separate from each other. They have different economies, separate economies. They have one currency, like the euro. The euro in Europe, they have the their currency, the dinar. Uh, but they don't have FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation. They keep secrets from each other. Uh, they have one foreign policy one uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and one ambassador in the United States of America, for example. And the United States has one ambassador in Abu Dhabi, which represents the United States vis-a-vis -vis all the seven uh, countries of, the, of the, uh, the Emirates of the Union. And they have one army, which is more or less a coast, coast guard. Uh, and, and so they are uh, uh, sovereign, seven sovereign states uh, which share some things like the European Union. So just to put things uh, in order. Um, another thing which we should always uh, uh, bear in mind with, when, when we come to this regime, that these are traditional countries, means they are not progressive like uh, as Syria or Iraq as it was under the socialism, the Ba'ath Party in uh, both countries or the... Arab Socialist Party in, in Egypt, uh, and, therefore, and because they are ruled by emirs, and they have no elections, they don't need elections, because those emirs are a legitimate 
leaders and they are real leaders and they are leading as long as they have their mind. So uh, they are traditional countries, which the progressive countries uh, used to call them contra-revolutionary. Because we are revolutionary countries, you know, Syria, Iraq, Libya, uh, Egypt, and they looked upon Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and Kuwait and Bahrain and Oman as a contra-revolution. Uh, and here the, the history proved that the progressive countries actually became uh, hell. Look at Syria today, look at Iraq. Uh, Egypt is sinking anyway in the <clears throat> economic problems. Libya is a bloodbath. Yemen, which was also uh, uh, some kind of Marxist uh, uh, regime. So all these progressive uh, Arab countries became uh, like, like hell, while the traditional countries uh, like Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Qatar, uh, Qatar Kuwait, uh, uh, Oman, and Bahrain uh, remain stable because they are more corresponding with the culture of the tribe, which is the ruling culture of the Middle East. Uh, as a result, the progressive countries, the revolutionary countries, where all the years, I'm talking about the 50s, 60s, 70s, they were attached to the Soviet Union, which viewed itself as progressive and uh, revolutionary vis-a-vis -vis the democracies in the West. Therefore, all those traditional countries in the Gulf uh, looked, uh, seeked refuge uh, under the wings of America and Britain and NATO. And this actually what uh, uh, characterized the Arab world since the 50s, that the Arab world was sharply divided between countries which were uh, under the auspice of the Soviet Union, uh, Syria, Iraq, uh, Libya, Egypt for a while until the 70s, and South Yemen, uh, Algeria, uh, while traditional countries remained uh, under the American wing as some, some kind of protection from the progressive countries, which tried always to undermine the regimes. And here we are, we, Israel, were also targeted and attacked once and again by whom? By the progressive countries, means the revolutionary countries who try to promote the Arab nationalism uh, on the expense of Israel. So all the wars which we had were all actually with countries which were led by the Soviet Union under the ideas of all kinds of socialism, uh, while the uh, traditional countries never took any part in any war against Israel. Not only this, uh, in the 90s, a, a, a ship which belonged to the to the Israeli uh, uh, naval forces uh, got stuck. It, it had bad engine vis-a-vis uh, -vis the the coast of uh, of Saudi Arabia in the Red Sea, and uh, and the ship was uh, flown to the to the Saudi shore and got stuck there. And it took Israel some four or five days to draw to drag this uh, this ship. Uh, away from there. The Saudis did nothing. I'm talking about something which happened 20 years ago. They only sent a few jeeps just to keep that uh, everything remains okay over there. And the Israelis actually went on the seashore of the Saudis you know, to take care of this ship. And later came a, 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 another ship from Israel, from Elat, and dragged it. So, and, and the Saudis, of course, somebody in Jerusalem called America called Washington, and, then, and, and somebody from Washington called Riyadh and told the guys there, hey guys, Israeli ship is stuck there, no, nobody is attacking you, uh, please uh, calm down and uh, let them take, the, take care of the issue. And that's what, it, what happened. And many other things which I cannot speak about, ah, I, I can speak about something. As you might know, the ruling family in Saudi Arabia uh, suffers from all kinds of diseases because of their uh, the changing food during the last uh, decades. And uh, one of the problems uh, is uh, problems of uh, men, uh, uh, urology. And an Israeli urologist, uh, Professor Moshe Mani, uh, one of the hardcore of the Israeli 
medical uh, establishment. He was the director manager of the Ministry of Health. He was the dean of the medical school in Tel Aviv University. He was the manager of the Sheba uh, uh, hospital. He used to disappear for many years, disappear twice a year for a week. Nobody in the country where he went, uh, knew where he went, uh, only one man. It was, was the prime minister. He left a letter on the prime minister's uh, uh, desk. I am going to Saudi Arabia uh, to do my job. And he would, took a flight to Greece usually, and there an airplane uh, waited for him, the airplane which was would belong to a, a billionaire named Adnan Khachukji, the uncle of the Khachukji who was uh, uh, murdered in, the, in Istanbul. And this uh, Adnan Khachukji used to take uh, uh, Moshe Mani to Riyadh, to an, air, to an airport, which you don't have to stamp your, uh, your passport. And for a week he was there taking care of the most sensitive problems of the ruling family. And nobody in, in, in Israel knew about this, nobody in the world knew about this. Only after he stopped doing it, uh, it leaked to the, uh, to the, to the media means that the, the most sensitive issues of the ruling family in Saudi Arabia were taking, taken care of by an Israeli doctor. And everybody knew that he's coming from Israel. Of course, he spoke Arabic. This is why they spoke to him and trusted him. But you know what? In this issue, they actually followed the tradition of the, uh, of the Islamic history, which many uh, Islamic rulers, caliphs, emirs, sultans, had Jewish doctors. Because, first of all, apparently those Jewish doctors were good doctors. But not only this, the main problem is that the doctors used to also to, to produce the medications. And uh, a doctor could poison the, the emir whenever he wanted, or the ruler. And the Jews were not suspected to be willing to, uh, to poison the ruler, because the Jews never had any aspirations to take over the, 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 the rulership. So uh, they trusted Jews in their most sensitive problems until this very day. So just to show you that the Saudis and their neighbors uh, really did not have anything profound against Israel, neither territorial issues nor history. And they actually shared with them the fear from the countries which were always uh, uh, threatening them, uh, uh, you know, like Egypt and Syria and Iraq and so forth. So uh, the background is, I would say, a very positive background between Israel and those countries. And now comes the biggest problem, which is Iran. And Iran threatens them much more than they, th they threaten us, but they are, they do not have our culture. Our culture, our Jewish culture, <coughs> dictates on us to shout and scream whenever we sense a problem or a danger. Because of our history, because of the Holocaust, because of the persecution, because everything. We are, uh, I would say, uh, professional whiners. And a good so, because otherwise, who will hear us? Uh, in, in the Bedouin culture, you are, you are not allowed to show your emotions. You have to, if, even if you are afraid, if you, if you are angry, you should make a poker face, always. Why? Because if you externalize your, your expressions, you are viewed as a, forgive me, as, as a woman. Because a woman cannot hold her emotions. But a man should always uh, keep calm and project uh, uh, calmness and uh, that he is in control of the situation. This is why they don't shout and scream as we do in the American Congress and in other places about the Iranian issue. But believe me, they are shaking and shivering much more than we here in Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian problem, because of some reasons. First of all, they are much closer to Iran. We have a buffer zone named Iraq and Jordan. Uh, they don't have neither Iraq nor Jordan. They are only the Gulf in between them. And the Emirates uh, are close to, to, to Iran, like a few dozens of kilometers, only the Hormuz Straits. So they are definitely much closer to Iran. Uh, not, not, not only this, 
their oil and gas industry is exposed, is right under the noses of the Iranians. Our, our industry of, of gas is under the sea, under the Mediterranean, very far from the Iranians. So they are much more vulnerable uh, compared to us. And the Saudis are much more attractive because uh, Saudis have Mecca and Medina. And, and the Iranians keep saying that they should restore, they should restore the Shi'i rulership over Mecca and Medina in order to restore the caliphate of Ali bin Abi Talib, uh, which was canceled in, 19, in, in 661 CE, 14 centuries almost ago. So, uh, and, and, and taking over Mecca and Medina is one of the goals of, the, of Iran, in addition to the oil and in addition to all kinds of things which they have between them. So they are, uh, the, the, the Gulf Emirates and Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, of course, and Oman are much more attractive than Israel because they have much more oil and gas. They are much closer to Israel and uh, uh, they have some kind of religious issues with Iran, especially sectarian issues because of the Sunni Shi uh, divide. So this is why they are, ah, another very important thing, they cannot deter the Iranians. Israel allegedly, according to all kinds of foreign media, has some kind of weapons which might deter the Iranians. The Saudis never had it, do not have it, neither the, the, the Emiratis or the Kuwaitis or all the others in the Gulf. So their ability to deter the Iranians is much smaller than Israel. So now you can understand why uh, now when the Iranian issue becomes so acute, uh, because they see that even uh, Trump's uh, sanctions, even the fact that the uh, uh, United States left the JCPOA, uh, even the fact that uh, there is uh, uh, the all kinds of uh, secondary uh, 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 boycotts on, on, on Iran by countries which are afraid of the United States of America, Iran doesn't collapse. And they are much more afraid of Biden if he comes to, if he wins in the elections of November, uh, he will go, go back to the JCPOA, to the agreement about the nuclear issue. He will return, he, he will lift all the, uh, all the sanctions from Iran, and the Iranian regime will be much more emboldened than it is today. So they want to give Trump the benefit of the, of the peace between them and Israel as the kind of the sponsor of this, of this uh, uh, peace. And this actually what explains the fact that tomorrow, and we are talking now on, on Sunday, the 30th of August of 2020, tomorrow uh, there is the first El Al flight to the Emirates, LY971, 971, because this is the, the international code of the phone in the, in the Emirates, 971. And uh, uh, lo and behold, the, the, the airplane, the El Al flight, will carry not only Israelis, also American delegation. Means the Americans want to be in this wedding since the beginning in order to give Trump the, uh, the hello of the one who brought the peace between Israel and the Emirates. It might bring some Jews to vote for, for Trump or maybe not to go to vote because they do not want to vote to Trump, but they would not vote for Biden as well. So, uh, in order, in, in, by the way, in, in my humble view, I do expect that the peace agreement between the Israel and the Emirates will be signed on the loan of the White House like three, four days before the elections. Uh, I will not be surprised because, again, it is some kind of a production, and Trump, believe me, uh, wants to reproduce the scenery in which Jimmy Carter held the hands of both Sadat and Begin in 1979 on the same loan of the White House. Uh, Clinton held the hands of Arafat and uh, Rabin. And uh, now Trump wants to hold the hands of uh, Netanyahu and uh, Mohammed bin Zayed. And maybe, maybe, maybe uh, there will be some more. Maybe the Saudis, they, they are, Pompeo last week went to Sudan, went to other countries, to Oman, I think, as well, in order to convince them to join 
this party. So Trump will be able to stand with three or four more people, not only with two, uh, in order to produce a better picture. And in, in, okay, in order to show, maybe he will win uh, the Nobel Prize for for peace because of this. So uh, okay, so this is the whole thing. Both the Emiratis and the Israelis are willing to give Trump the uh, uh, sponsorship of this peace, and this is why the American uh, involvement in this uh, in this uh, uh, peace between Israel and the Emirates since the beginning. Already, like uh, three weeks ago, when the announcement was made by Trump, by Muhammad bin Zayed, and by Netanyahu, uh, almost at the same time, and now the delegation goes for the negotiations, which haven't started yet, uh, with the three parties, the Americans in the room, and the Israelis, and the Emiratis. So uh, this is actually the background. And, uh, and, and, and the, the important thing, another important thing is, that we are, now we are not talking about peace. Now we are talking about normalization, which is way beyond, beyond peace. Because peace we have, we have with Egypt and, Egypt and Jordan, and Mauritania as well. But this peace is no more than, not much, not much more than non-belligerence. The cooperation between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Jordan is very low when it comes to economy, when it comes to academic issues, when it comes to culture and, and visitors and, and, and uh, uh, tourists and all these things. Uh, while with the Emirates, we already, already yesterday, Muhammad bin Zayed, actually his boss, uh, issued a decree which uh, uh, lifts or cancels the boycott on Israel uh, which the Emirates accepted since the beginning in the 70s. So actually, he, he started the economic uh, the economic ties with Israel before the negotiations started. Uh, Dr. Keda, I um, I see one difference here bet between the impending uh, peace agreement with the United um, Emirates than the ones we had with Jordan and Egypt, in that, in my opinion, the peace agreements we had with Jordan and Egypt were government-to-government -government peace agreements, and it didn't come down to the rank-and-file citizens, the people on the street. Uh, and it's been kept that way for decades. I don't know if you agree with me. But the thing that I noticed out of the agreement with the United Arab Emirates, I'm picking up the absolute positive response coming not only from the uh, the leadership, but also the academics and even people on the street, as we see on the social media. You are an expert in Arabic, you speak Arabic, you read Arabic, you understand Arabic. Are you getting the same reflection that I'm getting coming out of the UAE that we didn't get out of Egypt and out of uh, Jordan? Well, Barry, this is an excellent question because this is a very, very important difference, as you mentioned. But don't forget that what we have today is something which wasn't there uh, in the 70s when, it, when we had the peace with Egypt, and in the 90s when we had the peace with Jordan, the social media. Today, uh, nobody uh, has to restrict his knowledge to what the state propaganda gives him. Today, you go to the Google, and you Google Israel, you Google uh, um, industry in Israel, agriculture in Israel, uh, um, uh, arts in Israel, theater in Israel, whatever you want in Israel, and you know everything, everything. You don't need the, the official media to tell you. And uh, not only this, today you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have Instagram, you have WhatsApp, you have all these applications, which are internet-based, and uh, you can create relations as much as you like without this, the censorship, almost without any censorship of the, of the authorities. I correspond with Emiratis for years already. Of course, in Arabic, and not only in Arabic. The fact that I speak Arabic actually facilitates it. I have many uh, followers on Twitter, 
I have many followers on Facebook. I correspond with them. I speak to them. And you know what? Not only the Emiratis, also in Saudi Arabia, also in Yemen, also in Kuwait, also in uh, Oman, in Bahrain, all these countries, and, or, in other, and Syria as well, because uh, Syrians today understand that Israel is not the problem, the regime is the problem. So today, there are, between people, there are no borders as they were in the past. This is why many of them are curious about Israel, are, are, are I would say, passionate uh, to create relations with Israel, not because they love Israel. Some of them do. You know, many of them have on Facebook or on Twitter their logo with the Israeli flag, Arabs with Israel's flag on their user, and everybody who goes to, into their user on Twitter, on Facebook, on whatever, see this flag right in front of his eyes, and they are not afraid of anyone. Means, of course, it comes from above, means the permission which the regimes actually give the people, because if there, would, if, if there was not a permission by the Emiratis uh, government to allow people to have relations with Israel, nobody would dare have Israeli flag on his user on Twitter or in Instagram or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the fact that the social media allows and enables and facilitates these connections, uh, definitely and many Israelis have connections through the social media with people in the Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, and in Iraq, and in all the Arab countries, whether they are friendly to Israel or hostile to Israel, many Israelis have ties to them. And from this point of view, Today, there are much more chances, much more ability, and much more opportunities for people-to-people uh, -people, uh, uh, connections uh, compared to what was in the 70s and also in the 90s. Having said that, having said that I, I, again, I go back on my thought that I'm seeing more positive response for this peace uh, agreement from the Emiratis than, than we get even today from major, ordinary Jordanians or Egyptians. But before I let you go, I want to ask you a couple of other questions. Um, could it be that because the Emiratis have kept the authentic ethnic tribal origins and customs rather than adopt radical Islamic, Islamic or, or even socialist agendas, is this perhaps the reason where they've been stable, where they've been peaceful and where they've been prosperous where others are failing in other states that you mentioned, Iraq, Syria, Libya, etc. Could it be that because they maintained their ethnic origins and concentrated on prosperity and peace, this is why they have their independence and they have their prosperity and are, uh, and are able to make peace with us? Definitely. It starts from the fact that their regimes are legitimate means viewed as legitimate by the people, unlike Syria, unlike Iraq, because of various reasons. They are part of the people, because the, the rulers are not, the, 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 the government is not by rulers, it's by leaders, real leaders. Those families who 200 years ago were the leaders of the tribe, so now they are the leaders of the state, which is a tribal state. Means they, they preserve the culture, and this is why they are legitimate. When, when you have a legitimate government or legitimate leadership, this leadership does not look for enemies. You, the, the leadership does not need enemies in order to galvanize the society behind or under the ages of an illegitimate uh, uh, leader, because they are, they, are, they are legitimate leaders. They don't need enemies. Uh, Syria needed an enemy, and Israel was there for it. Uh, Iraq needed an enemy, the Iranians and us. Uh, and Libya, definitely. Yemen. Uh, and, and this is why they didn't make peace with Israel. Uh, okay, Egypt got out of it because of various reasons, but uh, other countries, when they are ruled by illegitimate uh, ruler, they need Israel as an enemy. The Emiratis never felt that they are illegitimate. This is why they don't need us as, as, a, 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 as, as a, an enemy. But I have here to warn uh, my Israeli fellows. Israel seems to be too enthusiastic about this peace. 
you know, headlines and peace come and hugs and kisses and all kinds of things. The problem is that when you are viewed as too enthusiastic to have something, the price which you are going to pay for it becomes high. If Israel said, vis-a-vis -vis the peace with the Emirates, we are 72 years gone, we are already 72 years, we are flourishing democracy, we are a vibrant economy, we are part of the OECD, we don't really need any peace with any Arab country. Immediately the price would go down. Maybe if we projected this kind of message, uh, maybe there, was, there wouldn't be a, 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 a condition not to annex or not to, to spread our sovereignty over parts of Judea and Samaria. But since they absorbed it, see, they understood that we are very enthusiastic to have this peace, now they can raise the price. And this is the problem with Israelis, which cannot hold their mouths. Uh, and they, you know, politicians, media people, and, uh, and, and, and um, business people, they do not know how to act in the Middle East. Here, you never should show that you want a merchandise. And this is one very big problem, and I uh, expect, or I suspect, that the price which we will have to pay for this excellent piece will be too high. This is one thing. Second thing, we should always remember that we already had two agreements with two Arab countries, Qatar and Tunisia. Israel had a, a commercial representation in these two countries, official with Israeli flag on the street, in the street. Yet, these two countries cancelled this agreement, these agreements with Israel after the Second Intifada erupted in the late 2000s. Therefore, we should always bear in mind that any peace, as good as it can be, with the Emirates, can be cancelled, halted, suspended, call it the way you like. It, you have no guarantee that this thing will forever be in a high level as it is supposed to be. And this is why we should not be, we should not pay any significant price for this peace. Like what Netanyahu said, peace for peace, not land for peace. What <laughs> the problem is that we did pay a, a, a payment in, in land. We suspended or postponed the Israeli declare on sovereignty on parts of the Judean Samaria, which belong to us since the San Remo Convention of 1920. We gave a, a territorial price, and we should name it a territorial price for this peace with, uh, uh, with the Emirates. And I don't think that Netanyahu is right by saying that this is peace for peace, because it is not. Israel committed itself to postpone for at least four years uh, the declaration of sovereignty over Judea and Samaria and parts of, parts of Judea and Samaria. And, and we should uh, refrain from paying any price for something which we do not really need. Only if we, we want to make sure that Trump has the photo op on the lawn of the White House. Yeah, well, actually, you anticipated my uh, final question when you mentioned Qatar, because as you quite rightly said, we established, and uh, people don't know this, a trade relationship with Qatar way back in 1996. Uh, and yet, uh, we had, a, like you said, a trade office was there, but it was closed when Israel had to respond to overwhelming terror, including rockets from us, and Qatar... Uh, broke their relationship and their and their peace agreement or trade agreement with Israel. Do you think there would be a similar danger here with the United Emi uh, Arab Emirates if, for instance, we have to respond to massive uh, intifadas or rocket attacks from the Palestinians? Could it be of as flimsy as that? Of course we should take it in account. You know, uh, we uh, uh, started the peace with Egypt in March of 1982, when the, when the 
Ambassador Saad Murtada, the Egyptian first ambassador, came to Israel and opened the embassy in Tel Aviv. Three months later, when the uh, first Lebanon war erupted and Israel invaded Lebanon, Murtada left Israel, and for years he was out of Israel. And the level of representation went down from, at least from the Egyptian side, from uh, from uh, ambassador to charge d'affaires. And d definitely we, we experienced this, that as well. So uh, nothing here is, you know, policy in the Middle East is built on sand dunes because this is the Middle East. The Middle East is a desert and a desert is full of sand dunes and you cannot build a steady building on sand dunes. And this is why we should always be very careful before we pay any real estate or real price for something which can move according to the matzav haruach, as we say in Hebrew, the situation of the wind uh, or the mood, uh, which is more or less the same here in, in Hebrew. Well, on that note, uh, Dr. Kedar, thank you very much. Your point is that peace agreements between Israel, the Jewish state, and the Arab countries are often built on shifting sand. And unfortunately, there's almost too much shifting sand here in the Middle East. Uh, Dr. Kedar, thank you for joining us on The View from Israel. Thank you so much, Barry, for having me. Thank you. Dr. Martin Sherman is the founder of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, Dr. Sherman, Martin, welcome to The View from Israel. Thank you for having me. What are, what are your views of the uh, Israel-United Arab Emirates uh, uh, peace agreement? Um, good? Is it good for the Jews? Is it good for, for, bad for the Jews? Let us know what your thoughts are. Well, I would say, in principle, as a standalone issue, it's certainly positive. Uh, we can go into what the positive aspects are a bit later. But the question is, is it really a standalone issue? And what does Israel have to give up for that agreement? Now, there are all sorts of rumors that Israel has uh, more or less uh, postponed, at least postponed. Uh, some people say given up indefinitely the idea of annexation, or as other people prefer, the term is to extend Israeli sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. Now, let me be quite clear. I think that sovereignty over Judea and Samaria is probably more important than basically what is the formalization of ongoing relations with the Emirates. Because it's not as if Israel does not have relations with them. It has relations. I mean, it's not really a peace agreement, but it's a normalization agreement. To give up uh, the prospects of Israeli control of Judea and Samaria, I would say, is a very high price, if not exorbitant. The value, or let's say the latent value in the agreement, is that it may be a prop in choreographing a larger drama. And the larger drama is how this will impact in some way, the elections for the American presidency in November. Because if this can nudge, if this is perceived as a, as a, uh, a foreign policy success for Trump and can nudge him over the finishing line ahead of Biden, then it certainly is worth it. Because Israel will be in two different strategic universes, depending on the outcome of the November elections. Uh, you know, the Trump administration up until now has been probably the most pro-Israeli administration in record, on record, uh, probably even more pro-Israeli than the Israeli government itself. You know, the, the, there's a, a long list of uh, decisions that the Trump administration has made which have been very much in Israel's favor whether it's recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of the country, whether it's moving the embassy to the, if it's uh, recognizing Israeli control and sovereignty over the Golan, legalizing 
the in their eyes the the uh, Israeli communities in Judea and Samaria, whether it's uh, pulling out of the Iran agreement and imposing punishing sanctions on Iran, whether it's uh, defunding UNRWA and, and and the Palestinian Authority. These are all huge pluses for Israel, and there would be no chance at all that a Biden administration would carry on in the same uh, in, in the same spirit. So. If this can be a prop in choreographing the the, the drama of the uh, November elections in the U.S., then I think that that, that could be it, its real value, rather than any substantive value that is for Israel. Although it's it's nice, you know, it's it's good to have uh, relations with an important and wealthy Arab Arab state, uh, particularly as this seems to indicate that uh, the Palestinian issue is not that central anymore to Arab states, and, and, and some are actually willing to act in that spirit. Um, so, so, you know, from 30,000 feet, that's more or less my take on the agreement. Don't you think now they'll join this, this normalization process, that um, when we're happily received um, citizens from the United Arab Emirates, um, that we uh, or your Israel uh, Institute of Strategic Studies uh, welcomes and hosts certain influential members of the UAE and take them onto some of the places that you've been and photographed and show them the strategic importance in holding onto the high ground of uh, Samaria, particularly when they're standing there and see below their feet Ben Gurion Airport. Tel Aviv, the Khadera power station, because I think when people come from abroad, even from the Emirates, and they see the vulnerability of the Israel coastal plain, they will return home, don't you think, with a completely different perspective from one they've held up till now? Well, you, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, I, I agree with you that, it, that it's a vital interest, a vital Israeli interest to prevent the highlands overlooking the coastal plain, the airport, important uh, infrastructure installations and systems uh, from falling into hostile uh, hostile hands. And, and, and the lesson of the land for peace principle over the last couple of decades is that every time Israel relinquishes territory in the hope, in the hope of attaining peace, it's always become a platform from which to attack Israel whether it was when he withdrew from South Lebanon or withdrew from Gaza or withdrew from the Sinai, which I don't think as yet is, has uh, um, actually reflecting how dangerous that could eventually become, or whether it's from Judea and Samaria, it's always been a platform, uh, rather than promoting peace, a platform from which to launch attacks on Israel. The, the, if annexation is off the table, then the price for normalizing relations, normalizing substantive relations with the uh, UAE is, is an exorbitant price uh, to play. I think once they appreciate and see our vulnerability, they would probably, uh, a part of their normalization, realize the essential elements of, of, for instance, as I said, retaining certain borders that are not on the 67 lines, or even going into places like Mali, Adomim, and Ariel, and other places like that, and realize that it's simply impossible to evacuate 600,000 Jews from towns, not just little settlements, towns and major villages, universities and schools, etc., that are placed in Judea and Samaria. From the territory that's allegedly on the table, for a Palestinian state, you can you control virtually everything within the, the coastal plain. That includes airports, uh, Israel's only international airport, Ben Gurion. That includes military military airfields. That includes ports and 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 uh, naval bases. That includes major uh, infrastructure installations like uh, water conveyance, like uh, power generation and power conveyance. Uh, centers of uh, government administration and military command, uh, and 80% of the population and 80% of the commercial activity, these will all be uh, within range of primitive weapons being used today 
to bombard Israel from territory that was handed over in the hope of attaining peace or at least stability. So I, I, I certainly agree with you. I think that, that, that uh, this is something that needs government backing. And I've been extremely disappointed with the uh, attitude of uh, Israeli government uh, officials, even at the ministerial level, as to the importance of, uh, of, of presenting this case forcefully. You, you know, in, in many ways, public diplomacy is, uh, is, is like the Air Force, because the classical function of the Air Force was to generate freedom of movement for the ground troops that they could, so that they could achieve their uh, objectives. And in the same way, public diplomacy should uh, give the strategic leaders of the country enough room, freedom, degrees of freedom for them to achieve their objectives. And if one of the objectives is to prevent hostile elements taking over the high ground of Judea and Samaria, then that must be that, that that freedom of movement to attain that objective must be generated by a forceful, assertive, strategic public diplomacy initiative. Our interview here, our talks will be um, there'll be a link to it, and uh, hopefully we'll also have a uh, subheading in a translation in Arabic. So, if any of our viewers wanted to obtain the information that the Israel Institutes of Strategic Studies have produced including, for instance, the uh, photographs uh, that you have taken on the high ground of, uh, of Shabon, and also the videos. Where can they uh, obtain this material and see for themselves? A site called uh, a series of photographs, which is an album uh, called um, Israel Through the Eyes of a Palestinian Intelligence Officer, which will show exactly the, the vulnerability, and there's a short commentary there, and uh, the, the, the photographs all annotated, showing the, the various items in the photograph, whether it's a, a, an important high-rise with government offices in it, or whether it's the main runway at uh, Ben Gurion Airport, or whether it's the proximity of the Trans-Israel Highway, which is which would in certain parts only be 70 meters from the individual borders of a Palestinian state. Uh, showing the, the, the impossible security situation that Israel would, would be in if it were to link to that territory. You know, basically, uh, you would, would expect a, a mega Gaza on the fringes of your most populated area with uh, tunnels there for ambushing uh, traffic on, the, uh, on, on one of the main uh, traffic accesses of the, of the country. Um, so, uh, that, that would be the easiest way to access those photographs, is to go to the, the Facebook page of the Israeli Institute for Strategic Studies and scroll down slightly until you, you, you hit the link to the, the, the album. Is there also a there website a... that we could put on the uh, screen that people could go to? There is, there, there is a website. Uh, it's probably less updated than the Facebook page, but there is a website uh, which is www strategic-israel.org. Uh, and when there have been instances when Israel has been forced to respond, either by massive uh, terror attacks, like in the Intifada, or, or huge, massive um, bombardments of rockets from uh, Gaza Strip by Hamas, then all agreements uh, have been torn up. Yes, that's true, but I, I don't know how fickle or faithful uh, that phenomenon will turn out to be. Uh, you know, public opinion can, can turn on a nickel. Uh, if you remember, as I said, the, you know, if you, uh, contacts between people at person to person level uh, were very evident with Turkey and with, with Iran as well. Uh, you, you know, there was, there, was, there was a lot of interpersonal contact with Iran and with, with Turkey, and that uh, evaporated with the change of the political climate. So on, on the one hand, what, what you say is true, but in, in often, not always, but often people-to-people -people contact is a function of the, the, the attitude of the incumbent regime. And if the regime changes, uh, the people-to-people -people, uh, climate might change as well, as it did in Turkey and in, uh, in, in Iran. So what you're saying, basically, that it could turn on a dime based on a change of regime at the top. If that's true, then how do you, how, what's your attitude as you look in the other direction? You look westward to, to America. I mean, uh, this agreement seems to come of a, 
cut us out of nowhere, basically, by the Trump administration. Um, how do you think uh, things may change over there if, for instance, uh, Trump is deposed in the November election over there and we have a Biden administration? The Biden uh, ticket uh, uh, won, the won the elections. Uh, Israel would be in a very, very difficult uh, position because, uh, uh, you know, we can't really rely on uh, on uh, the United States and the Democratic uh, administration, and we certainly can't rely on Western, uh, Western Europe. Uh, I think one of the, one of the important things that Israel has managed to do is to put a wedge into the EU with the, the warm relations that it's managed to, to form with the Central and Eastern Europe, which basically, um, basically stymie any uh, uh, veto, uh, veto, or stymie any uh, uh, decision on sanctions against Israel, because uh, decisions in the EU have to be unanimous. Um, uh, what can you share with us about the time when uh, Biden threatened, I think it was Menachem Begin, to withhold USA to Israel? Oh, oh yes, uh, uh, of course. Uh, you know, the Biden has threatened, and he threatened. Uh, Netanyahu, if I remember correctly, it was Netanyahu of uh, the building in uh, in uh, Matshlomo in East, East Jerusalem as well. I mean, I I, th I think uh, Biden would be a complete uh, weathercock, and I uh, would put very little store in any of his pro-Israel uh, pro-Israel promises and pledges today. I think uh, he'd be, he'd be a, a puppet of the, the the hard left in the party, and you can see that from his choice of uh, Vice President running mate. Uh, Kamala Harris is, uh, is uh, one of the most radical uh, uh, people ever to, to be on the ticket. And uh, given what's rumored to be the frailty of uh, uh, Biden's health and faculties, she could, she could well become a very dominant figure, if not uh, president herself, uh, before the term is out. Again, do you think that uh, we could cope with uh, normalization with countries like the UAE and um, without uh, affecting our strategic interests? Yeah, I don't think we should exaggerate the strategic importance of this agreement as a standalone. That's nice. You know, it's, it's got a lot of positive aspects to it. But uh, I, I certainly think that uh, we shouldn't sacrifice vital strategic interests for it. And if it means that we have to carry, to, if we have to raise the issue of sovereignty later, we certainly have to, and that means sacrificing you know, the, the formalization of our relations with the Emirates, then so be it. And from my observation, look, you have Malay Adamim, you have Ariel, you have all the Israeli towns and villages, and they will remain Israeli towns and villages, the U, Israeli universities are there. Uh, the Jews there will never be anything but Israeli. And today, today there are over 630,000. So I would guess by the time the Palestinians come around to recognize in Israel and the God-given rights of the Jews to live in their ancient homeland, there'll be over a million Jews living in Judea and Samaria. So in my opinion, the attitude of uh, sovereignty has not been canceled. The status quo remains the same suspended maybe, frozen for now maybe, but uh, that's uh, the issue of that. <clears throat> the other attitude that I want to say, it, it just summarizing that I thing, for Israel and Jews you have to understand that sovereignty is a state of mind, not a piece of paper. Um, now the other thing is that, uh, as we've heard from our three speakers, uh, the agreement that was announced by the White House uh, with the uh, United Arab uh, Emirates came to us completely out of the blue. And in my opinion, Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, received, deserves to receive the Nobel Peace Prize for a couple of good reasons. One of which is that if the Nobel Committee decided to give the Nobel Peace Prize to Barack Obama just 16 days after his presidency, and the results have been no peace anywhere in the Middle East, in fact, the Middle East far more inflamed than it was uh, before he became president eight years ago. Then, in my opinion, if, if Obama deserved it, uh, then certainly Donald Trump 
with this amazing first agreement between Israel, the Jewish state, and an Arab state for 26 years is very deserving of the Nobel Peace Prize. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on The View from Israel. Yoram Messinger is a former ambassador and consultant to Israeli and US uh, legislators. Uh, uh, ambassador Ettinger, welcome to The View from Israel. Thank you very much. Right. Ambassador Ettinger, we were waiting for the ambitious prosperity to peace plan, uh, the one that uh, uh, Trump launched a few uh, months ago, in which the Arab states would create a almost call it an Arab Marshall Plan for a Palestinian state in return for Palestinian recognition of the Jewish state of Israel and the willingness to compromise on land in return for the establishment of a prosperous Palestine, which they refused. And then out of the blue came the announcement of a peace agreement structured apparently by Jared Kushner of a UA, uh, UAE Israel peace deal. What's your initial impression when you, as an experienced diplomat, heard the news of this be details of the uh, of the plan? Well, uh, the, there are two different issues: the so-called President Trump peace uh, plan, and then there is the Israel United Arab Emirates uh, full normalization accord. Uh, those are two different issues. Uh, in fact, the accord between the United Arab Emirates and Israel exposes the myth of Palestinian centrality in the Middle East. Anyone who assumes that the Palestinians constitute a major issue in the Middle East, crown jewel of Arab policy uh, makers, uh, should turn to the UAE-Israel agreement to realize that here we have a major step forward in establishing Israel Arab peace in defiance of Palestinian threats, Palestinian protest, Palestinian uh, boycott. And the reality is that no Arab country considers the Palestinian issue to be a top priority. In fact, almost all of them consider the Palestinians to be a negative element in the Middle East, a role model of uh, terrorism, subversion, and ingratitude. Uh, Sadly, the Trump uh, plan includes a direct link between the application of Israeli law to the Jordan Valley and the mountain ridges of Judea Samaria on one hand, and the acceptance of a principle of a Palestinian state in the vast majority of uh, the area of uh, Judea and Samaria. This assumption has been exposed as out of touch with the Middle East reality by the United Arab Emirates agreeing to conclude a major accord with Israel despite Palestinians' objections. How do you think that this uh, agreement uh, will be uh, received in uh, the United States, especially as we're approaching uh, an election over there, a critical election, in my opinion? Well, the, the agreement highlights the very unique role of Israel as a force multiplier for the USA. If one wants to uh, understand the roots of the agreement between Israel and the UAE, one needs to go back to 1979. That's when the Shah of Iran was toppled by the Ayatollahs in Iran. Uh, this uh, event transformed the, uh, uh, the force of Iran in the Middle East from being the major policeman on behalf of America to the number one enemy of the USA. That also highlighted Israel as the only, as the only effective, reliable, democratic, strategic ally of the US. Since 1979, that role by Israel has increased geometrically. 
And today, not only the United Arab Emirates, but every single pro-American Arab country considers Israel to be the most effective and credible life insurance agent. In fact, we are more trusted by the pro-American Arab countries than is the USA. The USA under President Obama turned its back on the pro-US Arab regimes, embracing the Ayatollahs of uh, Iran. Uh, the three and a half years of President uh, Trump have changed uh, that attitude. But the Arabs in the Persian Gulf are very concerned. Will the current attitude of policy by the US, will it be sustained after the November 2020 election? One thing they know, whether it's a left-leaning or right-leaning coalition in Israel, they can rely on Israel because for Israel and for the United Arab Emirates, just as it is for Israel and Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and Kuwait and Oman and even Jordan and Egypt, both sides, the Arab side and the Israeli side, consider the Ayatollahs of Iran to be the number one mutual threat. In fact, it's a trilateral threat to pro-American Arab countries, to Israel and to the USA. And Israel, again, proves itself to be a unique force multiplier. And one of the extension of that is that contrary to the conventional myth, the US does not grant Israel foreign aid. The U.S. invests in Israel, and in return, it derives an annual benefit or an annual rate of return, which is five, six, or seven times as much as what it invests in Israel annually. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Obama and Iran because Obama is perceived not only in Israel, but in the moderate Arab states very negatively, because not only because of the uh, Iran uh, 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 agreement that he, he, he made, nuclear agreement, which is frowned on by not only Israel, but the Arab states, because he, he funded basically the Iranian hegemony and terror that they've experienced around the Middle East. Um, but that there's been a speak about or proposal or idea that uh, if uh, when this uh, deal is signed between Israel and the UAE, which came out of nowhere, that President Trump should be awarded a Nobel Peace Prize, a peace prize, by the way, that was given to Obama probably about 16 days after he had been made president. And in the time since, during his eight years, he did more to destabilize in the Middle East than actually achieve peace anywhere. What's your thoughts on that? Well, the, the major pitfalls of the Obama-Biden administration uh, had to do with the overall policy towards the Middle East and with the policy towards the Palestinian issue. When it comes to the overall policy towards the Middle East by the Obama-Biden administration, uh, one can observe the notion of Arab Spring, which was promoted by the Obama-Biden uh, administration. Uh, they deluded themselves that the riots, the violence on the Arab street, in fact, it was, according to them, March of Democracy, Facebook Revolution, Youth uh, Revolution, they welcomed, in fact, they welcomed the uh, traumatic events on the Arab street as a step forward towards peace and towards democracy. Well, we know the reality that contrary to the Obama-Biden state of mind, that has not been Arab Spring. This has been a very vicious, violent, Arab tsunami, and we ain't seen, we ain't seen uh, uh, nothing yet. Uh, much more is expected to, uh, to come. Uh, a, a very uh, clear evidence to the uh, erroneous 
misperception of the Middle East uh, was in Libya. It was the Obama-Biden administration which led the assault on Gaddafi. It's true, Gaddafi was a despot, but Gaddafi, for the last few years of his rule, was a major warrior against Islamic terrorism. He transferred his nuclear uh, infrastructure to Tennessee in the USA. He stopped developing chemical and biological warfare. And it was that uh, Arab leader which was targeted by Obama Biden. And the outcome has been transforming Libya from a despotic but ruled country into a lawless platform of international anti-U.S. Islamic uh, terrorism. When it comes to the Palestinian issue, the Obama-Biden uh, policy uh, was a classic uh, policy of considering the Palestinian issue to be the core cause of Middle East violence, which has nothing to do with reality. None of the major events in the Middle East has had anything to do with the Palestinian uh, issue. They considered the Palestinian issue to be a crown jewel of Arab policy uh, makers. And as a result, in fact, they subordinated the pursuit of Arab-Israeli peace process to the whims of the Palestinian. And here, not only Egypt-Israel peace treaty and Israel-Jordan peace treaty, but now also the United Arab Emirates and Israel full normalization agreement, those accords expose the, not only the myth of the Palestinian centrality, but the damage to the region and therefore to American interest resulting from such a faulty policy which reflected, which characterized the Obama-Biden administration. Yes, um, I agree with you because the Arab Spring was known by uh, quite a number of uh, military and strategic experts in, uh, in Israel. It became the Islamic winter. And even under the Obama-Biden administration, um, we had the, uh, the spread of the Iranian uh, influence hegemony via Hezbollah, Iraq into Syria, and also the rise of ISIS, another Islamic uh, uh, terror organization which, which took over huge tracts of uh, geography that, uh, by, uh, that uh, Obama called once the JV team, dismissing it and doing nothing to, uh, uh, to reduce its uh, spread. Um, but, Dr. Ettinger, uh, uh, sorry, Ambassador Ettinger, you've been an advocate for declaring Israeli sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, or at least part, large parts of it. What's your thoughts in light of the conditional normalization process with the UAE, which they says is, is conditional on us uh, um, suspending, if you like, the, uh, the, the uh, sovereignty in parts of Judea and Samaria. What's your thoughts? Do we go ahead with the deal? Or what's your uh, opinion of it? Well, f first of all, thank you very much for the title, but I'm not uh, a doctor. I don't have a no. PhD <laughs> uh, degree. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, when it comes to the application of Israeli law on one hand and the uh, accord with the UAE on the other hand, uh, those are two different leagues. With all due respect, to the peace accord with the UAE, which is very important and very, very positive. It is not, it is not critical for Israel's national uh, security. At the same time, Israel's control of the mountain ridges of Judea and Samaria constitutes a prerequisite for the existence of the Jewish state. A retreat from the mountains of Judea and Samaria from the Jordan Valley would be tantamount to clear and present threat to the existence of the Jewish uh, of the Jewish state, and therefore, and therefore, my hope, uh, my hope is that Israel is not going to renounce 
the obligation, in fact, not only the right, but the obligation to apply its laws to this area. In fact, it's an American interest. Israel has become a major force multiplier for the USA. Israel has become the major defense line of the Hashemite regime in Jordan and indirectly of the uh, regimes in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and the UAE and Oman and Kuwait, and certainly a major contribution to the stability of the general Sisi regime in Egypt because of our posture of deterrence. Israel's posture of deterrence has been a derivative of its military mind bolstered by geography and topography, namely the Golan Heights in the north and the mountain ridges of Judea and Samaria in the heart of Israel, in the center of Israel. For Israel to retreat from those mountains, we would lose, we would lose much of our effective role in Middle East stability or minimization of Middle East insanity and instability. Once we retreat from the Jordan Valley and the mountains of Judea and Samaria, we lose our importance for the survival of the Hashemite regime in uh, Jordan, which is the reason why, irrespective of the Jordanian talk against the application of the law, when it comes to the Jordanian walk, they fear the moment if and when Israel withdraws from those uh, areas. It's an American interest, it's a Jordanian interest, it's a moderate Arab interest, and obviously an Israeli interest to establish full Israeli control over Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley. Israel's no, uh, refraining from application of the law would reflect and does reflect, in fact, hesitancy, uh, indecisiveness. Indecisiveness is rightly interpreted in the Middle East as weakness. And once you start that type of uh, trend, you very rapidly lose partial deterrence, which would add fuel to the Middle East fire at the expense of very vital American interest. So summarizing what you said, you suggest that um, Israel should approach this uh, agreement both with the UAE or Bahrain or anybody coming after them with a positive but affirmative uh, attitude so that it's clear to us and it's clear to our adversaries, those who want to make peace with us, exactly the, the guidelines to which this peace must uh, be maintained. Well, I'm, I'm not aware, for instance, that uh, Israel's application of its law to the whole of Jerusalem or Israel's application of its laws to the Golan Heights have in any way, in any way, torpedoed the peace process between Israel and the Arab countries. And the reason is very obvious. With all due respect to Israel, with all due respect to Judea and Samaria and the Golan Heights and Jerusalem, as far as Arab are, Arabs are concerned, there are many more, much more important issues for their own survival than our limited area in the Middle East. And therefore, when uh, Prime Minister Begin applied the Israeli law uh, to the Golan Heights in 1981, it did not, it did not uh, impact negatively the Israel-Egypt peace uh, treaty. In fact, when the U.S. recognized Jerusalem as capital of Israel, we all heard the very, very negative predictions it would cause supposedly an upheaval uh, throughout the Muslim world, throughout the Middle East, throughout the uh, Palestinian uh, Authority. None of the above happened because Middle East reality is very different than the very superficial, overly simplified, simplistic uh, Western uh, perception. In fact, the misperception that Israel must supposedly wait for a green light from the White House 
in order to apply Israeli law, uh, uh, contradicts reality. I'm not aware that Prime Minister Ben-Gurion, who applied Israeli law to major parts of the Negev in southern Israel, to the Galilee in northern Israel, to much of the coastal plain, to western Jerusalem after the 1948-49 War of Independence, I'm not aware that the prime minister was waiting for a U.S. nod. In fact, the application of the law by Prime Minister Ben-Gurion was in defiance of very brutal pressure by President Truman, by Secretary of State George Marshall, by the Europeans, by the UN. It was accompanied by threats to deny Israel any economic uh, financial uh, assistance. Ben-Gurion's very determined position to apply the Israel law regardless of the odds, indeed earned him and Israel much long-term respect. The same thing happened when Prime Minister Eshkol reunited Jerusalem, applied the Israeli law to uh, Eastern uh, Jerusalem. That was accompanied by very vicious pressure by the U.S., by the Europeans, by the U.N., uh, there were certain Israeli circles that opposed it, but in the long run, it only enhanced respect towards Israel. And the same thing applied to Prime Minister Begin when he applied the Israeli law uh, to the Golan Heights. In fact, the idea that we should sacrifice our own independence of national security action uh, on the altar of a White House green light uh, negates many more precedents. Uh, Israel uh, bombed, demolished the Iraqi nuclear reactor in defiance of very brutal uh, U.S. opposition. Israel carried out the six days uh, preemptive war in defiance of White House opposition. And therefore, anyone, anyone who states that supposedly, ostensibly, no application of Israeli law can take place without U.S. White House uh, green light simply contradicts uh, reality. Well, with that, Ambassador Entinger, I want to thank you very much for being on uh, The View from Israel. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.